So today our topic is money, power, and fame. Not the normal title we have at church. So how many of you ever have felt that desire for money, power, or fame? Yes. Oh, I love that. Thank you. (laughs) Julian enthusiastically puts his hand up. (laughs) So it was 1986. I was at my brother's house and his fiancée's, who became his wife. We watched Top Gun. They were making fun of me for liking Tom Cruise with his shirt off, playing volleyball. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I remember my brother just out of nowhere turned to me and he said, So Harriet, if, if money, f- power, and fame don't motivate you, what does? And I remember being so struck by that question only because I hadn't really thought about money, power, and fame as sort of the big three, which clearly he had identified, and that he assumed most of the people had this in the world and I did not. So it's always stayed with me. And I think the reason why he perceived me as not having those desires is because for me, uh, clearly because so, so many of you owned it, uh, for me it was something that was um, disasso- not disassociated, separated. I clearly by this point loved God. I wanted to, my life to be a thing of service. So when that's the conversation, it's almost like money, power, and fame, I'm just too good for that. You know, I'm just, I'm way above those things. <laughs> and I recognized in, the, in the him, I didn't realize that that's how I was perceived until he asked me the question. And I thought, because I actually didn't, I didn't lie to myself about that, but I was surprised that that's how someone else perceived me. So the way I did it, and I'm, I'm bringing it up because I think as we go on our spiritual journey, uh, we're, uh, we're all on this spiritual journey that we don't have, we can, money, power, and fame can become like shadows, things that we think are about ego, about uh, shallow things, and we can disassociate. Shadow is something we disassociate from, and we may be embarrassed to own or admit that those are things that we want. So for me, I remember being on the balcony, as many of you know, I made a decision at one point, hello, welcome, come come on in, (laughs) Um, that I wanted to be an actress, and it was not based out of any deep soul, I've never been in a play, soul longing, it just seemed fun, I had been in college for four years, and we wrote lots of papers and read lots of books, and everything felt like from the neck up, and it seemed like actors, like, um, just played for a living. They were with other people. They weren't off in the library studying, and it just seemed really fun. So I remember being on the balcony and having a discussion with God and saying, okay, look, I recognize that my desire to be an actress has no, is not motivated by any desire to serve the world (laughs) or to be a good person or it's completely ego-based. I want to do it for me to have fun if I get some fame, power, and money along the way, that's great. I would love that too. And I know all of this is terrible, but I can't help it. I got to do it. <laughs> so I owned it, but I didn't go around talking about it. And then I remember being in acting school and being surprised by how many of my classmates were very clear the reason why they were there was to be famous. And I'm like, shh, you don't say that out loud. <laughs> Although I knew many people who also, uh, growing up, were very clear they wanted to have money. There were other people very clear they wanted to have power. So what do we do with these desires that, I think in essence, when my brother asked me that question, what he was recognizing, that these are three big things that all human beings tend to play with in our life. So all of them contain each other, but I often find talking to people that there's one more than the other that tends to draw us and say, I want that one a little bit more than other ones. And we've matured. So I think sometimes when we're young, those money, power, and fame are a little bit raw. But then we've had, many of us have had many decades now to be with some of our desires. And what I've seen with some people who are successful, and I was thinking, I was trying to go through, and then I don't have their permission, so I'm not going to say names, but there's, there are people I know who are very specifically had said they want money, power, and fame. And they have all achieved it. But what's interesting to me is how much they've changed in the getting of money, power, and fame. These are different individuals. That, that in their pursuit 
of having a lot of money or in their pursuit of having power. And they were never ashamed to say that they wanted those things. And in their pursuit or desire to have fame, they became different people. And as they became different people, the way they expressed wealth, the way they expressed power, the way they expressed fame is in a wonderful way that serves everybody. And what that taught me was and is that when we're on the spiritual journey, you're here because you're already spiritual. Anything that you desire is going to be changed because of who you are. So we have these what we might call base desires, but they're very essential. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. These base desires, but because of who we are as beings, that gets recalibrated as we embody those qualities more and more. So even if you're not on a spiritual journey, but you have strong ethics and strong integrity, you're going to use those qualities of money, power, and fame in a positive way. That in fact, if all people have this basic desire for money, power, and fame, and we'll talk about what's behind that, uh, the fear isn't the actual money or the actual power or the actual fame, it's the misuse of the money. It's to say, I'm special and I'm different. Now I have money and I use it for myself and I don't and I hoard it and I don't share it with other people versus having a generous heart and a generous spirit and using your money to be a philanthropist, to help other people create their money and to create lives that they want. Power, to use power to support your life to be as fully, uh, fully rich and, and, and fulfilled as possible and also using that power to support other people to become empowered in their life. To use your fame to say, I see you. To, so if people are looking at me because I'm famous and then I turn around and say, I see you. So using all of these qualities, if we, if we have those basic integrity, these basic values, those qualities actually become really powerful. And, and not only powerful, but as I was really with these qualities, vital. And I mean vitality. One of the things that I've really loved reading in, the, in um, these various books about the Hindu teaching especially is the importance of vitality. And what I mean by vitality, and I don't mean adrenaline, I mean vitality is like, a, so we talk about we have three bodies, a physical body, an energy body, and a causal body. Vitality is our energy body. So anytime we're doing any sort of breath work, using our chi, which is your chi like qigong, or um, prana, or shakti, or in the Christian language that would be Holy Spirit, that there is a, there's this energy that's beyond our physical body that's everywhere present. And when we start tapping into that, we become more conscious and more awake. So in the Hindu theology, they say there's three ways of being in the human world. That some, so a very high level, uh, not just morals, uh, just sort of saint-like. They're, they're the people who walk the earth, very high vibration. They're very conscious beings. And then there's the middle group of people that have a lot of energy and are doing a lot of stuff. So often they have high vitality used in different ways. It can be used for good or bad. And then the lowest is inertia. It's called tamasic. Now, when I was reading in Sri Aurobindo, he was just sort of stating what it was with no value judgments. But it was interesting to me when I was reading the same thing with Paramahansa Yogananda. He had very strong opinions. And they, it struck me because the thing that he said that really caught my attention was he said, it is better to have energy and be pursuing the wrong goal, so be in that middle part with lots of energy, than to have inertia. That for him, inertia is the last, the, like the worst way you want to be. So if you're on a spiritual path and what you're seeking is comfort and security and safety, that's the lowest vibration right there. And so he said, if, because his view, his perception, the way he just explained it was, if you have already a lot of energy, you're used to pursuing something, you're used to getting up in the morning and getting things done and moving, and suddenly you have a spiritual awakening or something shifts in you, it is very easy to just to shift that energy to something positive. 
All it is is just a shift of perception, a shift of attention, a shift of focus. But that energy you're already used to activating on a regular and daily basis. If you are inert, if you are very passive, if you're just sort of sitting around and you have this shift of awareness, it is still very hard to move out of that inertia, to push the energy forward in a direction that is positive and good because inertia feeds on itself. This world was made out of density and the whole evolutionary process is about waking up into that wonderful vibration. So things like money, fame, and power get the energy going. They get the vitality going. And so wherever we are on that stage, I, also, I, I think of young people maybe having more of a base desire and it evolves as we grow. But wherever we are on that stage is to allow ourselves to feel it, to allow itself to drive us, to allow it to wake us up in the morning and drive towards something because we will, by our very nature of being spiritually conscious beings, everyone here I know lives by incredibly high values and principles and integrity. All of that will get applied to this thing called money, fame, and power, and it will be used in a wonderful way. And it's better to... So I remember one of the things that I love about Reverend Michael... Um, one of the, you may have heard there's a spiritual practice called inquiry. And that's where you're doing a process, who am I? There's variations of it, but it's basically, who am I? Who am I really? And, and to go where you're not answering the question with your mind, I'm, I'm Harriet, I'm blah, 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 with your historical answer, or even conceptual answer, I'm a spiritual being, to not answer it with concepts, to live in the question and and move beyond the world of concepts, to let something bigger transcend it beyond the world of mind, start to reveal who you are. But what I also loved is he always followed that question with, and what do you really want? And the reason why I think that's so important is because one of, uh, one of the books I really loved was Ramana Maharshi's uh, book, talks with Ramana Maharshi and his main practice is inquiry, who am I really? And I read all 500 pages when Julian was, when I was nursing Julian, I had a lot of time to read. And it was, it was just, it's an incredibly still practice and I would get so still to the point where it actually concerned me <laughs> because Ramana Maharshi did lead a life where he just went up to a mountain and he went to total absolute bliss and never then participated again in the world. And I can get into those places sometimes of just being in so still where there's not a lot of push to move out into the world. And the what do I really want is that push. It is that vitalizing energy to say, okay, there is this part of me that is already in bliss, but there's this whole human side of me that's here for a reason, to participate. And it needs to be acknowledged. We need to acknowledge and listen to our human self. Sometimes we get so far on the spiritual journey that we actually forget we're human beings. The <laughs> this past week we were talking about concentration in one of our classes, and I was sharing that um, for me one of the hard challenges in meditation is I get really bored. So I like stimulation, and there's sometimes, and sometimes when I'm doing a meditation, I'm just, I'll be five minutes into it, I'm like, yeah, I'm bored with my breath right now. <laughs> Think about something else. <laughs> and then people were startled. They're like, you get bored? And I'm like, yeah, I'm human. So I want to apologize first and foremost if I pretend that I'm not human. I am very human. <laughs> with all sorts of faults and limitations and, and shallowness. But all of it is God, and to praise and give thanks for all of our humanity in the midst of all our spirituality. So to say that those human desires are good. If you have a desire for fame, what you have a desire deeply for is to be connected with as many people as you want, as you can, to be seen. It's interesting, there was a video of all these famous people, I think some of us were laughing about this, all these famous people saying if what you want is fame, it's, a, it's, it's not real, it doesn't exist that you're, you're chasing a false hope. And I thought, well, the only reason why they're doing that is because pe they're famous and people are listening to them. <laughs> and they think people are listening to them, which is why they say these things. It's like Harrison Ford, who, who had so much money, and he was complaining about 
being seen all the time. Everybody recognized. There's just a couple of great stories we have. So Harrison Ford was one, and, and, and uh, they said, well, if we took some of your money away, so you wouldn't, be, and if, if we could take some of your money away, so you would and we made the agreement that you wouldn't be as famous, would you do it? And he said, not in a heartbeat. <laughs> Fame isn't that bad. And then Kevin Bacon was the funny one. He said, why, you know, I love being famous, and it's great, and there's a lot of good things that come with famous, but sometimes I just want to walk around anonymous. I just don't want people to know who I am. It gets tiring. So I had a makeup artist create this whole face, so I looked completely different. I was completely unrecognizable, and I went into a mall, and he said, nobody recognized me, and I hated it. <laughs> I'll never do that again. <laughs> And I love that because there is a joy, you know, the whole cheers norm, everybody knows your name, that when people walk in and say, hello, I love you, that's what the people who are famous, what, what Kevin was saying, actually, he said, what's nice is that you get all this love that you don't deserve, I don't even have to do anything, and people shower love on me, well, what if we do, I think inherently, we all want that love, we want to be seen, we want to be loved, and love other people, to people, what we do with famous people is if they then turn their attention back to us, we feel a little bit more important. We feel like, oh, a famous person has looked at me. Now I'm really seen. And so if we start valuing everybody with that incredible, wow, I'm in front of a superstar right now. I love you. I am so grateful that you're looking at me. I feel so privileged and honored that you're sharing your attention with me and that we have this incredible connection of recognizing how important each other are. So it's not just one way. It's two way and we really value each other. When we have power, power is the opposite of helplessness, where I have to walk through my life feeling like I don't really have much choice in my life or circumstances own me. Power is saying I can have some control over my conditions. I can have control over my reaction to my conditions or my response, more appropriately, to my conditions. I can affect some things in my life, and that feels great, and it's energizing, and, and it gives me vitality to participate in my world where it's not being done to me, but I get to participate and co-create with the divine in my world. That's energizing, and it's good. It is not to dominate other people. That's where it gets twisted. Fame gets twisted when we, we use it as a superior, a way to say that someone's better and everyone else is worse. Power gets twisted when we use it, that ability to have power to try to control other people. Ernest Holmes said he likes, uh, he believed in the control of conditions, but let's be very clear, it's not controlling people. And the money is about wanting to feel abundant. When I, there's this quality, as I talk with anyone who wants money, it doesn't take very long in the conversation before I, we recognize that behind that is freedom. That when we have money, we can have more choice. We have more possibilities. We can do more things. Immediately, people's minds go, well, I could do this or I could do that. And suddenly, all these possibilities start to open up. So there's the inherent desire for fame, for power, and for money, abundance, empowerment, to be seen, to be loved, to be connected, to feel an intimacy with all life. To me, those are all really positive, beautiful things. I was going to end with an invitation, but I, I want to take it one more step before we do that. And vitality is the next step to the highest level of being. So I, it's funny, I just, I see Gail there today. <laughs> it's so funny that you're here. Because I, I was thinking about Ueshiba, who I have not talked about since Unity of Tri-Valley, and I think one of the reasons why I read an autobiography of him is because um, Gail used to do Aikido, and he is the founder of Aikido. He's Japanese. So he had, a, he had a martial arts teacher and a spiritual teacher, and what's interesting about a spiritual teacher, whose name is very complicated and I can't say it, but he was in the late 1800s, and reading his spiritual philosophy, it's so close to new thought. It's astounding. And what I love when we talk about, there's, um, Victor Hugo said, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And we say there's only one mind, and that when that mind comes, it hits. So it hit here in the United States, the transcendental movement. Here it is landing almost in the same way in this, with this Japanese teacher, although a little bit more complex, with more complexity, but the same idea. And so he became Ueshiba's spiritual teacher and martial arts. So Ueshiba Aikido is about nonviolence. It wasn't about attacking. It's about moving to the side as, as aggression is coming towards you. But it's also, as all martial arts are, 
it's working with energy. And so he's working with the energy of the flow, of the movement. And he could do these amazing... So as he continued to grow, he would not fight, but combat, I don't know, duel <laughs> with martial artists. And he would do amazing things. And he was just a short little guy because he knew how to use this energy. He had this incredible power. That's the vitality. So that same vitality that we talk about with money, fame, and power is that same vitality, that same energy that Yogananda was saying is so essential and that's better than to have no vitality at all. And that when we start playing with that vitality, we can become masters of it. And what's interesting about Ueshiba is that as he grew and got older, that vitality got to a point where he didn't want to do Aikido anymore and he just would spend a lot of his time meditating. But now we have to be clear that this meditating isn't passive meditating. It's not just sitting quietly and being inert and all our energy becoming really dense and we're just, there's a picture of Buddha in repose, but I guarantee you he's not sleeping. There is an aliveness. There's this vitality. Yogananda, as I mentioned a couple times, when he was near the end of his life, he was doing this translation of the Bhagavad Gavita, which was over a thousand pages. So he spent a lot of time in this room. It wasn't just a few days. He was immersed. And this was right near the end of his life. And when he would come out from writing and being in this energy of this vital, vital energy, he would walk out and the monks who would serve him said that he would have to take a few steps back because the energy was just pouring at him that he couldn't come close. to. And it was soon after that Yogananda left because that vibration could no longer be maintained in his physical body. And this is what his point is, is that if we are going to continue on this process of waking up, that this vitality, it's not the end goal. Money, fame, and, and what's the other one? Power are not the end goal, but they are incredible gifts to us. They are not shadows to be avoided, to be shamed, ashamed of or embarrassed, but to be embraced to be embraced along with our spiritual journey because they are essential to have wants, to go towards, to want to get up from your meditation pillow or to get up in the bed and want to get up into the day to feel energized by it. And I think especially as we get older and older, one of the things that can happen is we get into a routine. We, the inertia actually hits a lot more as we get older because we get into routines. And, and I remember in my psychology class, they said that as we get older, if we don't consciously keep moving forward, we, will just, we just fall into the habit patterns of our parents without even realizing it. It just takes over. It just, it's there. So we have to push. There's an energy and a vitality, but that vitality is exactly the same vitality that gets us to those highest places of enlightenment. So when we're sitting in meditation, we're not asleep, we're not in this density, but we're alive and awake. There's, a, there's an energy that we did not create. This is not adrenaline. This is vitality. And it all comes from this wonderful thing called breath. So my invitation this week... Well, first of all, is to have the courage to face, to not to face, because now we know it's not bad, to own all your wants. Notice if you have wants that you think are base or shallow or egotistical. Just notice that and say, well, what's behind those desires? So if you, let's say there's fame, what's that desire behind, their fa behind that fame? And how much do I want those wants? So I'm using money, power, and fame as the main themes. And what you may want may not feel like it's under one of those themes. But here's what can happen on the spiritual journey, too, is it gets really bland. I want peace. I want to feel joy. That can feel really bland and doesn't necessarily get us up in the morning. I want to feel joy. Well, I can just sit there and feel joy. I don't have to go out and participate in the day to feel joy. And I've, and I've met many people um, who, who feel a little bit bland sometimes. Oh, I'm just happy. Life is so good. We're so free. And I just want to, like, mm. like, come on, let's have some life. Let's do something. Let's, let's create. <laughs> we want to have life. Wants are good. Specific wants are good. Embrace your specific wants. What's getting you up in the morning do your meditation. Find that place of peace. Find that place of pure being. And, and, is it alive? 
I'm not talking about running around doing lots of busy stuff. That's not being awake. That's not the energy of what I'm talking about. It's just to do busy list. I'm talking about an incredible vital energy that isn't through that isn't of us that's moving through us. We recognize it when it happens. We're immediately in the flow. It's breathing us. It's flowing through us and we're alive in it and we are there's so much joy when we are living in that vitality. What brings you that joy? If you can just take away all judgments about what's good or bad, what brings you that joy? And just notice. And I also want you to notice any inertia that you have. Because we don't, the whole part of this is healing the shadow side. And so if there's inertia, if there's just like, yeah, I want it, but I'd rather just sort of sit and watch TV or play Xbox. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Just see if you're awake over there. <laughs> if, you wanted, if we just want to sort of sit and... Um, not even that sitting is bad, because you can do a lot of creative things while you're sitting. Uh, you can do writing and writing poetry and writing music. But participating, or, or do I just not feel like doing anything? I just want to veg out and not do anything. Not as a balance, not just as a moment of rest, but as a way of being. So, Yes, you can think. Yes, that's a very good point, Alan. And reflective, reflection, which is different than just zoning out, right? Like watching TV and just switching channels. That's the one that comes to me. But even, actually, there's a new one now. Um, sometimes I've caught myself on the computer just going through YouTubes, and I'm zoning out. I'm not really, I, I spent half an hour recently watching YouTubes, and I journaled right afterwards, and I said, I didn't get anything from that. I, all I, I didn't get fed. I, I didn't laugh. I, nothing. That was, a that was like a 30 minutes that will never come back. <laughs> and I didn't get anything from it. It didn't feed my soul. It didn't do anything. And I just, it, but I, it's so easy because it, it always says four minutes. So I'm like, oh, I'll just go into the next one, and then I'll go in. And the next thing I know, it's a half an hour, and I've watched like five videos of nothing. So anyway, that, that's a new one that's coming up in our modern technology. But those places where we just aren't participating. In fact, I didn't even think of it until this moment. Yogananda, I just saw this quote. Oh, sorry, I just, it was beautiful. It's something about, um, it is so easy to spend, the, it's an e spending the day foolishly is a very easy thing to do, but to participate in, in activity is one of the wisest ways we can spend every day, is to be participating in consciously with our day. So are you willing to do that, to look at your life? Where do you feel inertia? When are you just doing things because it's a, on a to-do list, but you're not really, this isn't the flow, you're just getting stuff done? And when are you alive? What is, when are you in alignment with what you want without any guilt, without any um, having to rationalize it in your head that it's good? Just like, I like doing this, whether it's good for anybody else or not. I want to do this. It brings me alive. I feel so alive right now. And how much of my day is spent with these three things? Just my to-do list, what brings me alive, and inertia. Just watch the flow of your days without judgment. This is a, a week of witnessing because we shut down and we don't see clearly when we judge. And we want to love ourselves enough to see who we are. And then, ask my, and then ask yourself sometime during the week, is this what I want? Do I want my life to be about tasks? Do I want my life to have more inertia than it has conscious flow of desire and activity? What do I want? And, and, and then we move into that empowering stage of what can I do to shift it? This is fun. Money, power, and fame rock. <laughs> What do you say, say Jack? Yep, I'm right there. Money, fame, power? <laughs> He's on his way. <laughs> all right. Look at all you famous people out there that I get to be with today. I'm so grateful. Powerful people, rich people. Oh, man. Can't wait to see the boss basket today. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. My mind just keeps going. Shh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Aren't we lucky? <clears throat> Aren't we blessed? 
that the divine has chosen to play in this world as all of us in this room and all over the planet, all, all the beings of everywhere, of all the wonderful, incredible diversity. Isn't it fun to just see how the many ways that the divine, this wonderful Holy Spirit wants to show up? Brahma, Allah, being, the thing itself, whatever the, the words, it is greater than all the words. And yet it is so fully alive in all the forms that we choose to celebrate. It doesn't judge any of these forms. This divine presence doesn't say this word or that word is the right word or is a bad word. It is all words, and it delights in all of its words and all of its forms and all of its formations as you and I and all beings on this planet. As nature, as minerals... As water, air, earth, fire, all the animals, insects, reptiles, birds. It is everything. We are immersed in this wonderful, wonderful world. And we, as individual expressions of God, in the midst of this wonderful, wonderful world, get to play that each and every one of us has our own unique desires that look completely different than everybody else in this room. We have wants, and those wants are holy. Those wants are here to serve us on our spiritual journey. Those wants, as we continue to dance and play in them, will not only serve our own highest vibration, our own highest fulfillment on this earth, on earth as it is heaven, it will, because of who we are, be carried and be a blessing to everyone with whom we come in contact. We know when we are in alignment with the one. We know when we are living our highest desires and joys, and we know that that joy overflows, overflows in opulence to all those with whom we come in contact, that we can't help but be generous with all of our beautiful love and intimacy that we feel, all the power that pours through us, all the beautiful abundance of good, of freedom, of joy, of clarity, of energy and vitality, that we are always being made brand new in every moment. We feel the vitality of the divine. We let it carry us. We allow it to open our bodies. We allow it to open our hearts. We allow it to open our minds. We allow it to open our souls. We allow ourselves to be changed by these wants. We allow ourselves to be changed by these deep, powerful, human and godly wants within us. We allow ourselves to be changed even now. We allow ourselves to be changed. And this is the powerful, wonderful, joyous journey of transformation, of awakening, of becoming fully alive, fulfilling our highest potentials as individuals and as a collective community. How grateful I am for the healing and the transformation that is happening in us even now. How grateful I am for all the places where we may have judged that we allow it to dissolve into the nothingness from which we came and we accept all of who we are. We accept all of those things that we may have previously called dark or other or not enough and we embrace all of who we are. And we embrace it with the light. There's only one power and there's one presence and we are it. We are the center where there is no circumference. I delight in God. I delight in this one. And with deep and abiding joy and gratitude that it is ever present and alive as all of us even now, I release this word now in joy and thanksgiving. And I invite us all to say together as one. And so it is. Amen. Amen. So it is. And so it is. And so it is. Amen. 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 And so it is.
Amen and Amen. <laughs>